I've been a book. Esther um, was one of the books which was some question about whether it should be in the Bible or not. It ultimately came in because it was uh, explained the origin of a very important Jewish festival, the Feast of Purim, hence a festive scroll. Um, uh, now, uh, the structure of uh, Esther, it's a story of a Jewish young girl and it's set in the court of a Persian king. Uh, you remember that after the Babylonians, the Persians were the superpower in the ancient world and they basically dominated things from around about uh, 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 50, 550 to 330 when Alexander the Great demolished the Persian Empire. Oh, yeah. uh, but it was by far the greatest empire that the world had ever seen and I still think it's uh, it, in its, its reach it's just as great as the Roman Empire but it hasn't had the same lasting effect. Now uh, the story begins with Ahasuerus, the Persian king, um, deposing his wife because she disobeys him. Didn't she, uh, she spits the dummy and so he has got to search for a New wife. Get just getting rid of him. Doesn't matter. He she ceases to be queen. Um, and he looks for a new wife, and he uh, um, sends out search parties to find a new wife and a new queen. And uh, Mordecai, who is a very prominent Jew, proposes that his niece um, uh, put herself forward as a candidate for queenhood. She's so beautiful that the king falls in love with her straight away at first sight and she becomes queen. But she keeps her identity as a Jew secret. Uh, Mordecai tells uh, her not to uh, put that up front. And um, uh, uh, then uh, 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 he discovers, he happens to discover a plot to assassinate the king. He tells uh, Esther this and she tells the king and when the king asks who did this come from she says Mordecai okay tick number one in his favor then um, chapter three to five a complicated story you get a real rogue by the name of Haman who becomes the prime minister of the Persian Empire and he demands that people whenever people come into his presence that they bow down before him Mordecai doesn't do this. And Mo Mordecai refuses to bow before him because he only bows down before God. God. Yeah. He only honours God. And uh, this irritates Harman so much that he, um, when he, uh, that he investigates Harman, finds out he's a Jew, and not only wants to kill Harman, but wants to exterminate the whole Jewish community. You mean Harman finds out that Mordecai is a Jew? Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Sorry, did I put it the other way? Yeah, you did. Okay, Harman finds out that Mordecai is a Jew, he wants to kill all the Jews. and he wants to then generalize, wants to kill all the Jews, and he offers to bribe the kings. He said, look, there are these people that don't fit in, they've got strange customs, they're bad people because they're different, exterminate them. And he says, what's more, I'm prepared to put a large amount of money, of my money, in the public treasury. Uh, uh, the king accepts it because he's prime minister, he knows what he's doing, he's done his uh, research, and so he gives permission um, to uh, 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 exterminate the Jews. But tables are turned through the intercession of Esther. Esther. She uh, exposes Haman, intercedes with the king, king changes his mind, and then Haman is executed and Mordecai becomes Prime Minister. Prime Minister. Okay, there's, a, there's more to it, you can read it for yourself. And then um, uh, uh, the Jewish community, which is the, this is one of many pogroms, you know, ex ex extent, uh, uh, attempts to exterminate the Jewish people, yep. they uh, institute, establish uh, the festival of Purim. Now Purim means lots. Um, because of the casting of lots, which is part of the story. Uh, Mordecai becomes deputy of the king. Happy story, ends well. What are the main themes of the book? The threat of pogrom for the Jews in Persia, the concern of Esther, the queen. She could have very easily 
forgotten about her people once she became queen, but she yeah. still remained faithful to her people and to God. She intercedes for them and saves them. And lastly, the triumph of the Jews over their enemies. Okay, what's the liturgical use? It's set for the Feast of Purim, late February, early March in our calendar. And it's, um, it's a festival that should be very popular for Australian Jews because it's an obligation on the Feast of Purim for every adult Jewish male to get so smashed that he doesn't know the difference between Haman and Mordecai. Uh, uh, you get the picture. Okay, what's the purpose of the book? Stephen, can you read the summary? Chapter 9, 20 to 22, and then 26 to 28. Mordecai recorded these events, and he sent letters to all the Jews throughout the provinces of King Xerxes, near and far, to have them celebrate annually the 14th and 15th days of the month of Adar as the time when the Jews got relief from their enemies, and as the month when their sorrow was turned into joy, and the mourning into a day of celebration. He wrote them to observe the days as days of feasting and joy, and giving presents of food to one another, and gifts to the poor. Notice the gifts to the poor too, that's still very much part of this celebration for Jews. Uh, then 26 to 28. Therefore, these days were called Purim, from the word Pur. Because of everything written in this letter, and because of what they had seen and what had happened to them, the Jews took it upon themselves to establish the custom that they and their descendants and all who joined them should without fail observe these two days every year in the way prescribed and at the time appointed. Okay, that's it. Um, not a very important book. It's uh, uh, not used in our three electionary at all. Never in all my life have I... Um, uh, heard a sermon preached on it, preached a sermon on it, uh, taken a Bible study on it. Um, it's a fairly peripheral book. The next one, however, is more important, the book of Daniel. Okay, I better, uh, uh, I'm, I'm getting the timing right for a change. You're, 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 young man, you are turning into a cynic. And that's bad. Okay, Daniel. Um, now, Daniel, uh, the focus here is on God's work, not in the history of Israel, but in the history of the whole world. It's an eschatological book because it has to do with God's plans and purposes for the whole of humanity. And it deals with the end of the world, the end of human history. Now, it's also a wisdom book. If I can give you the basic theology of Daniel before we look at the parts. Um, there's two sides to this theology. Number one is that God uh, appoints kings to rule over nations. And God works through the kings that he's appointed. So it doesn't matter whether they are believers or unbelievers. All kings do God's work here on earth. He empowers them in their rule, and if they disobey him, if they flaunt God's will, if they uh, deal with uh, uh, unjustly, uh, unfairly with their people, God disempowers them and dethrones them. So the basic the theology is it's God who puts politicians, kings on their thrones, it's God who removes kings from their thrones. It's God who steers the course of world history. Um, and he uses the nations then not to fulfill their plans, but his plans. God's ultimate purpose. And you won't see the plan of God at any point in history. You'll only see the plan of God at the end of human history. Just as, you know, in wisdom, you can't see what God's doing when he's doing it. It's only when you look back and you see where God has brought you, that you can see the hand of God retrospectively. Can you see that? You, you understand God's working not forwards, but backwards, backwards from the end, the goal. Yes? But I mean, you can sort of see that through history, that real tyrants, like the hugest tyrants of all time, usually are deposed fairly 
quickly Soon. after being discovered. Or yes, they are. and they seem to be so powerful for a little while, and yet yeah. they vanish so quickly yeah. from the human stage. Uh, whereas just kings, good kings, hang not uh, they mightn't hang around, but the the fruit of what they've done lasts for a long period of time. They, they, they don't prosper, but they cause their country yeah. and their dynasty, their kingdom, to prosper. So like the Roman emperor, he, would have been, he was a good emperor, the, ruled it well, according to God, the natural law. Yeah, because, according to natural law, the Romans were brilliant politicians. Mm. And they refused, until the latter part of their history, yeah. to, to set up their, their, uh, their chiefs, their Caesars, as God. They were just human beings. Exactly. And yeah. they... Uh, the great Roman legacy is that kings are not over law, but they're under law. So rule of law is something that we owe to the Romans, yeah. and it's because of the rule of law that the Roman Empire lasted. Yeah. It was a brilliant system, yeah? And, and, I mean, it was when that power started becoming abused in the Caesars. And then it, too powerful, and they into wars and whatnot. Yes. And, then it all, and worst of all, uh, if you know Roman history, in the latter part, First of all, kings were deified after their death, but then they were deified coronation. when, yes, coronation. Or at what, first of all, at one point in their life, if they did something great, they were deified. So it started de being deified at death. Then it was the great kings were deified during their life. And then finally, they were deified at their coronation. Yeah. And you can see the corruption coming then um, with that. Notice this question of deification, because that's one of the issues here in this book, where kings set themselves up as God instead of being servants of God. Okay, that's the one side to the theology. The other side to the theology is that God gives wisdom to Daniel and to people like Daniel, uh, the people of God, so that they can do what? understand the way God is at work in this. The problem is uh, the people who are involved in this don't see what? They don't see God at work and they don't see what God's purpose is. They just do this. It's the Daniels, God's people, wise people, that God gives his wisdom in order so that they can make sense, not just of their history, but of world history. That's the big picture. Okay, outline of the book. One of the funniest features of the book of Daniel is that it's written in two languages. Um, uh, the basic language, now half of it is in Hebrew, the other half of it is in Aramaic. Aramaic was the Semitic language, which was the, a common language, first of all, for the Persians and then for the Greeks in their world empire. So Aramaic was the ancient equivalent of uh, uh, English before Greek became the universal language. You, yes? You mean there was two books or he'd be writing in Hebrew and then next sentence is... Okay. Uh, no, not two books. It goes... So you go chapter 1, starts off in Hebrew, and at the middle of chapter 2, verse 4, you get a switch to Aramaic. So and then at, at the end of chapter 7, 28, beginning of chapter 8, you switch back to Hebrew. Um, uh, so, uh, uh, well, it's yeah, odd. it's a bit odd. It's somewhere here to here is the Aramaic insert into a Hebrew book. Now, what's the uh, structure of the book? Um, number one, you get the prologue of Daniel as one of uh, a, a series of hostages that the Babylonians took to the Persian court. He's a very clever um, young man. He belongs to the, 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 the bureaucrats around the king. Um, so you have the story of Daniel and his friends. And then you get the Aramaic section, which has to do with the theology that God is not just the God of Israel, but he's the Lord of all the nations. Yes? Is that in the Hebrew Bible, our, that Aramaic portion? Yes. Yes. So, so if I bring my Hebrew Bible, you can see the switch from Hebrew to Aramaic at that point. And it looks, you can see it. You can see it, yeah. It's there. It's obvious. It's 
very obvious. Thank it's you. Ob this, the script's the same, because oh, this, the, the script that you, you uh, learn, I don't know whether Dr. Lockwood's told you, is not the old Hebrew script, it's in fact is the Aramaic script. Oh, okay. um, if you actually were confronted with a uh, manuscript in old Hebrew script, now it's the same language, uh, but the lettering is different. Uh, it's as different as Greek from Roman script. Mm. Is that uh, different? Is that, what? I don't know. Latin, Latin and Greek. Latin, Latin, oh, yeah. Latin. Okay, English is Latin script, and then you have a look at Greek, or it's as different as Hebrew and in, or no, no, the, the other is more oh, yeah. because it's the same letters, the same sounds, but different letters for the same sounds. Oh, yeah. Okay? Yep, yep. Interesting. Okay. Uh, it begins then with Nebuchadnezzar, the, the uh, uh, Babylonian uh, king's dream of four kingdoms in succession. First of all, and they represent, they are depicted as four statues. There's a statue of gold, the first kingdom. Then there's a statue of silver, next kingdom. Then there's a statue of bronze. And finally, there's a statue of iron mixed with clay. Can you see the succession there? It starts off and it's getting from the strong, the precious, to the ordinary. Uh, okay. But the last one looks very strong because it's iron, and yet it's very brittle because that iron is mixed with clay. So it seems to be strong, but it's really very brittle. And he has a picture then in which there's a uh, uh, great stone that comes and destroys that fourth kingdom, that fourth statue. And the works of all the other ones are destroyed with it. Uh, they w w because they are successive. So they are four eras of world history, four kingdoms, and then there's the destruction of the last kingdom so that God can bring in his kingdom. Yeah. Right, that's the goal. What's God's plan? Is not human kingdom, but God's kingdom. What's God's kingdom? Is God's rule. So when Jesus talks the kingdom of God is near, he's thinking in terms of the book of Daniel. Um, then chapter 3, you get God's judgment on Nebuchadnezzar um, because he uh, 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 sets up an idol of himself and demands that people worship him as God. Uh, and uh, Daniel's friends refuse to bow down before the statue of the king, they are thrown in the fiery furnace and God delivers them from the fiery furnace. Yeah. Every Sunday school uh, student knows that wonderful story. Oh, yeah. And then there is, number four, there's God's judgment on Nebuchadnezzar for his pride. Uh, he uh, thinks that he is the greatest, he's divine, and what does God do? Takes away his sanity. Shucks him outside and, and he becomes animal-like, or he becomes even more debased than an animal. He imagines he's God, but he, in fact, is dehumanized. He loses his, div he, not his divinity, he never had it, he loses his humanity. humanity. And in the end, he has to acknowledge that God is Lord. Um, then, uh, chapter 5, you get uh, the God's judgment on Belshazzar, who is the last of the Babylonian king, who uh, 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 uses the temple vessels for a booze-up. So he desecrates the holy things of God uh, in a uh, kind of a booze-up, a, a, a drinking thing. And God brings judgment then on him. Remember the writing on the wall. You are weighed, you are found wanting. Um, you've been weighed in the balance, you have found wanting. The writing on the wall. And then uh, uh, you get uh, the same story being repeated by Darius the Persian king. Now it doesn't stop with the end of the Persians. Darius the Persian king demands that every day every person in his kingdom should pray to him. Daniel refuses to pray to the king, he prays to God uh, people inform on him, he's thrown in the lion's den, and God saves him from the lion's den. Once again, everybody knows that story. What? What happened to his friends at this point? They, we don't hear anything more about them after the fiery furnace. No. Then you get, uh, uh, then there's a change. Previously here now, um, 
Daniel interprets the dreams of others, now he, um, uh, he himself has visions and dreams, and an angel interprets his visions. Okay. Right, there's a switch at this point. Daniel has a vision of four kingdoms. Now going back to the four kingdoms here, there's the kingdom of the lion, followed by the kingdom of the bear, the kingdom of the leopard, and following the kingdom of a wild animal, a beast. And uh, these come in succession, and then finally uh, the last kingdom is suppl supplanted by the coming of a strange figure called the Son of Man, who takes over, and to whom God gives kingship and judgment and rule, and he shares his rule as the Son of Man together with the saints, the holy people of God. Now, the saints are both angels and Jewish people. The people of God. Is, so, is that when Jesus came on earth? Yes. Is that when Jesus yes. will come again? No, that's when Jesus came on earth. It's both. Don't, don't play those two off again. Oh, me... Remember that Jesus never refers to himself as the Messiah. He always said, refers to himself as the Son of, Son of Man. Where does he get that from? Daniel. Daniel 7. You need to just read that very closely and, and, oh. and have that in your mind because of its importance for Jesus. Jesus claims to be that person. Doesn't he claim to be, or indirectly say as Messiah when he asks? Okay, that's as well. But, the, but he never directly says, speaks about himself as, he never says, I the Messiah, but he speaks about himself as the Son of Man. Now, uh, there's good reason for that, which I won't go into it. Yeah. Um, uh, then uh, 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 Daniel has another vision about a ram, first of all, that comes, and then you get a he-goat that comes and drives out the ram. No, great big. And then the angel interprets this, uh, explaining that uh, the ram was the uh, Persians and the goat is the Greeks. Um, and then... Uh, 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 chapter 9, you get a very interesting passage, which is very important for a lot of speculation. Um, Daniel is reading the book of the prophet Jeremiah, and he reads Jeremiah's prophecy that the people of God will be in exile for 70 years. And he asks God to help him understand what's meant by 70 years. Are they literally just 70 years, or what? And then the angel comes and interprets the dreams and says that the um, 70 years are, are 70 sabbatical years. So they are 77s. What's sabbatical? Mean? Sabbatical, you know, you get uh, uh, the seventh, uh, sab Sabbath is the seventh day. So Sabbath is seven. So you get one to six, seven. So you get a sabbatical week, oh, yeah. right? You get a sabbatical year, which is six years, followed by seven years, and then there's the year of Jubilee, which is seven times seven. So this is 70 times seven weeks equals years. 70 times seven is? 490. So that relates to how many times, predecessors, how many times should I? Seven times seven, well, was also going back to that same symbolism. Now, by the way, you need to know this because all Jehovah's Witnesses and other people who try to predict the end of the world basically start off with this prophecy. Daniel that's stuff. That's why they um, weren't sure if Daniel was going to be in the... That's, that's the reason why Daniel was kicked out of the prophets into the writings because uh, people at the time of the revolt against Rome said that those 490 years were up, and they were then at, at 67 AD, which meant that the Son of Man would come, the Messiah would come. Now, the point of this vision of uh, uh, Daniel is that it's at the end of those 490 years that Jerusalem will be restored, the temple will be restored, and God will fulfill all prophecy, he will atone for all sin, he will get rid of all wickedness, and he will anoint the Most Holy One. Well, that's happened already. Yes. You're a bit late. 
The anoint the most holy one or the most holy thing could be anointing the most holy temple or anointing the most holy person who is the anointed one, the Messiah. Messiah means anointed person. And if Jesus is anointed, it means he is most holy, he's king. Right? So there's a bit of ambiguity there. Is it uh, that God will anoint, bring a new temple or a Messiah? Both. Can you see it? It's, the, the Hebrew indicates both of those. And then the book of Daniel ends, chapter 10 through to 12, um, with got, uh, a very complicated sets of scenarios. It's kind of a, like a movie with snapshots of the future. Uh, uh, Daniel has a vision of a heavenly messenger who reveals uh, to him what's going to happen at the end of human history. And the most important thing that he reveals is that there is going to be a resurrection both of just people and unjust. And the last judgment of God will come when? Not in human history, but after human history. It will come after the resurrection. And it's at that point that God's people will be vindicated. They will be delivered from exile. They will be delivered from exile in this world. And they will shine like stars. And they will receive their heavenly allotment. Not their earthly allotment, but their heavenly allotment. Very important for uh, our theology. You have your hand up? No, you're right. Okay. Um, now, the th main themes of this book. Uh, I haven't got a clue where we are. I'll start off with you, Dylan. Um, can you read those two passages? Uh, God's wisdom. Now, the two things that's emphasized about God is that he both has wisdom and power to fulfill his wisdom. Uh, uh, two passages there which speaks about the kingly wisdom of God who raises up and overrules human kings. Chapter 2, 20 to 23. Then Daniel praised the God of heaven and said, Praise be to the name of God forever and ever. Wisdom and power are his. He changes times and seasons. He sets up kings and deposes them. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to the discerning. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what lies in darkness and light dwells within him. Right. He raises up kings and deposes them, and he gives wisdom. I know those two things. Uh, chapter uh, 4, 43 to 47, please. Forty-three to forty-seven. Thirty-four. Uh, oh no! Okay, sorry, I'm dyslexic. Four thirty-four to thirty-seven. At the end of that time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes towards heaven, and my sanity was restored. Then I praised the Most High. I honoured and glorified Him who lives forever. His dominion is an eternal dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the people of the earth are regarded as nothing. He does as he pleases with the powers of heaven and the peoples of the earth. No one can hold back his hand or say to him, What have you done? At the same time that my sanity was restored, my honor and splendor were returned to me for the glory of my kingdom. My advisers and nobles sought me out, and I was restored to my throne and became even greater than before. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and exalt and glorify the King of Heaven, because everything He does is right, and all His ways are just, and those who walk in pride He is able to humble. God humbles those kings that are proud. At the end, Nebuchadnezzar acknowledges two things. One is that God is King, not He. And number two, he acknowledges that uh, what counts is not His Kingdom, but God's Kingdom. Uh, that God is King. And uh, the purpose of human history is not to establish a Babylonian kingdom on earth, but God's kingdom will be established on earth. How time? Let's have a look at one more passage. Um, the theme of wisdom, Joshua. 
uh, God gives wisdom to his faith, Daniel, his faithful people, so that they can understand his purpose, his plan for the nations, but also themselves. Um, please read those two passages. 2 verse 27 to 30. Daniel answered the king, No wise men, enchanters, magicians, or diviners can show to the king the mystery that the king is asking. But there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries, and he has disclosed to King Nebuchadnezzar what will happen at the end of the days. Your dream and the visions of your head as you lay in bed were these. To you, O king, as you lay in bed, came thoughts of what, you, of what would be hereafter, and the revealer of mysteries disclosed to you what is to be. But as for me, this mystery has not been revealed to me, because of any wisdom that I have, more than any other living being, but in order that the interpretation may be known to the king, and that you might understand the thoughts of your mind. Okay. God gives wisdom to Daniel so that he understands the plans and purposes of God. Um, verse 47 then, the final end of the chapter there. The king said to Daniel, Truly your God is God of gods and Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries, for you have been able to reveal this mystery. Now mystery means something that's hidden. If you look at world history, if you study world history, what's the mystery that you will not be able, no historian can discover? You'll be able to see what human beings are doing in history, but you can't see what God's doing, what God's doing and what God's purpose is. You can see human beings, but you can't see the hand of God, even though God is involved in there. He's not just involved in the history of the church, and he's not just involved in your life, but he is involved in world history, uh, what we call secular history. Okay, that's what we'll do it so far today. Uh, I have set down as a week from today the next test. Now, we'll be a bit rushed to get it done by then, so I propose that I put that test back to uh, the following Wednesday. Wednesday. Okay. So, Wednesday week, we have the next test yep. on the writings. Yep. So, not next week.